All right, so let's, let's review real quick note-taking strategies. Are you writing this down? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The main thing that you should be doing is thinking about the ideas. The more you think about the ideas, the more you will remember them. If you don't understand an idea, you definitely won't remember it. So just be thinking about and trying to understand what we're talking about. If you don't understand something, raise your hand. You should probably write some stuff down. And I recommend that you write it down in a notebook because it's easier to focus with a notebook than with a computer where you could potentially switch from taking notes to doing literally anything more interesting than that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you should not write down everything on the slide, and you should definitely not try to write down everything that I say. You should just try to write down the main, like kind of the general main ideas, and copy kind of the flow of ideas. Um, when I take notes on lectures, I use a lot of bullet points and a lot of arrows to show like causation or connection. Um, so, Tim, why do you have your earbuds in? Do you think listening to music helps you? Helps me calm down while I write everything on screen. <laughs> That's literally the exact opposite. <laughs> well, I love to do it because, like, if I miss something important, like... but you're definitely missing almost everything because you're listening to music and just furiously typing every word on the screen. So just try to be present. Try to follow the thread of the ideas, and then just jot down some general ideas. When I, st when I was taking history classes, and granted, I'm a history weirdo, nerd guy. When I was taking history classes, I almost never actually looked at my notes. The notes, note taking was a practice that helped me be present for the lecture. And then when I studied, I went back and looked at the slides again, and I looked at my textbook, and I watched random YouTube videos, although back when I was a student, YouTube was still in its very early days. Um, so yeah, um, and I would encourage you just to try this, and if it doesn't work and you hate it, you can go back to doing whatever you feel like is the best way to do it. All right, now with that being said, let's talk about the Mongols in Russia. So what are some big ideas that we're going to talk about? We are going to talk about how the Mongols taking over Russia impacted Russian development. I think we started talking about where Russia came from yesterday. Does anybody remember who founded, quote unquote, Russia? Lorelei. Um, Viking slave traders. Viking slave traders founded Russia. They sailed up and down the, the rivers of Eastern Europe, and they founded fort cities on those rivers, um, including cities like Novgorod and Kiev and stuff like that. <coughs> When the Mongols showed up, they showed up at these cities, surrounded these cities, and gave them the deal that they gave everybody. And the Viking slave lord Russian princes were like, we don't know who you are. You look like a bunch of homeless horse people, flea-bitten weirdos. What are you going to do to us? We're Vikings. Bring it. And the Vikings proceed to annihilate them. Or sorry, the Mongols proceed to annihilate the Russians. They then claim control of all of Russia and then proceed to leave again because they don't like it there. They go back down to the southern Russian steppes and they appoint particular Russian cities to collect taxes for them. So the, Ru the Mongol rule of Russia turns out to actually be very good for the cities that don't get totally annihilated. However, it's really, really bad for Russian peasants. If there is one type of person in all of history that I'm really glad that I am not, I'm really glad that I was not born a Russian peasant. There is basically no time in history where being a Russian peasant is fun. Uh, you're either being enslaved by Vikings, overtaxed by Mongols, or like conscripted into the Russian army for World War II, or just exterminated by Stalin. So anyway, so the cities 
are going to become strong under the Mongols. And they're actually going to copy a lot of Mongol practices, including certain forms of Mongol dress. Long flowing silk robes are going to become common for the Russian elite. But also norms of Russian or Mongol government, where the ruler has absolute authority. The Mongol Khans do not believe in rule of law or checks and balances. Whatever the ruler says goes. That is going to be very influential in Russian history. Where even today, under Vladimir Putin, whoever is in charge is like really, really in charge. Mohammed, do you have a question? OK, cool. Um, so um, this is an image here of a particular military unit that was developed by the major city we're going to be looking at, which is Moscow, which is still the Russian capital today. These guys are known as the Strutsky. They are a professionally trained military force paid for by the ruler of Moscow, who is going to be known as the Tsar. We'll talk about that more later. And what are they doing here? Well, they wind up in a big line, and they are shooting Mongols in the face. <laughs> So basically, Russia is going to get gunpowder, train people to be really, really good in the use of gunpowder weapons, and then eventually use those gunpowder weapons to push the Mongols out of Russia. Yes? Also, it's a very good strategy to come back to the arrow strategy, where they just like surrounded them and then just got arrows and they all died. Uh -huh. Because now they could just stand in like a very big circle and then just shoot until all the Mongols are gone. Yeah, this is a pretty cool formation they got with this big arcing line. So they can protect themselves from all different directions. Cool. So let's back up a little bit. So the, the Russian rule, or the, the Mongol rule of Russia is known as the Golden Horde, or sometimes called the Khanate of the Golden Horde. So this begins around 1240 when Ogadai Khan rolls up and conquers everything including the main Russian city of Kiev, which is today rebuilt and is the capital of Ukraine. Do you know what Russians call Ukrainians? The Ukrainians hate it. But literally, in the Russian language, the word for Ukraine is Little Russia. <laughs> It'd be like if in North Carolina we called South Carolina second best Carolina. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I know. I know. I mean, everybody knows that North Carolina is the better Carolina. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, when the Russians, uh, when, the, or when the Mongols rule up and conquer Russia, they really don't like it, and they retreat back to the plains of southern Russia, which is the westernmost portion of the Eurasian steppe. From southern Russia, you can ride on horseback basically all the way to Korea, just rolling dry plains as far as the eye can see. This guy here is somebody known as a Cossack. You guys ever heard of a Cossack before? Cossacks are white dudes who are, in all other ways, basically Mongols. They live in the southern steppes of Russia. They herd horses and sheep and cattle. They live their lives on horseback. And the Mongols met these guys and were like, yeah, we can work with these dudes. Because they basically, culturally, were very similar to the Mongols in every way. Um, so they hung out in southern Russia, and they incorporated the Cossacks into the Mongolian Empire. And then they just picked a couple random princes in northern Russia to collect taxes from the poor peasants who lived up there. And they would have the princes deliver money and grain gold and whatever uh, once or twice a year. And other than that, they just let those princes in northern Russia do whatever they wanted while they hung out and partied with Cossacks. Do you know what the Mongols drank recreationally when it was time to have a Mongol party? Wine? Well, they didn't have wine because you have to grow grapes and Mongols don't farm. They didn't have beer because they didn't grow grain, which is what you need to make beer. So what they did is they drank 
Yeah. Fermented horse milk. Horse oh. what? Yeah. Horse milk. The horse milk is really sweet compared to cow's milk, so there's a lot of sugar in it, which means you can ferment that sugar and make a drinkable alcoholic yogurt called arach. And in a Mongol huts, it was normal to have a big leather pouch, horse leather pouch, full of fermenting horse milk. And when you came into a Mongol tent, the polite thing to do was to slap this big, fat, leather pouch of yogurt when you came in to announce your entry. But also, slapping the yogurt would mix it up a little bit and help it ferment better. That, I guarantee you, will not be on any test. And nobody will ever tell you that again. So hold on to that. Treasure that. Now, so. So basically, what's going on in the Golden Horde is the Mongols and the Cossacks are hanging out getting drunk on horse yogurt, um, while the, they let the Russians oppress each other. They have the Russian princes oppress the Russian farmers, take as much money as they can from the Russian farmers, and then give it to the Cossacks and the Mongols so they can buy more silk and more horse yogurt. Right. But they already have the horses. Well, that's true. Okay. So all the other stuff besides the horse yogurt. All right. Sometimes I really wish I could be a Cossack. It seems fun. Although I don't know how the yogurt would actually taste. I'm sure it's an acquired taste. I want to try it. Come here, could you, could you go to the next slide for me? So, um, what are the, uh, so one of the big impacts of the Mongols is that this is where Moscow comes from. Moscow was a very minor power before the Mongols showed up, but Moscow picked the right side. When the Mongols rolled up, Kiev was like, bring it on, and the Mongols killed them. And then the great city of Novgorod was like, bring it on, and the Mongols killed them. And Moscow was like, oh my gosh, we would love to be a part of the Mongol Empire. And so the princes of Moscow were given the privilege of taxing the surrounding countryside. So they basically became the Mongols' stooges and the Mongols' enforcers. And the princes of Moscow were then able to use their tax collecting privileges to grow their own power. And so Moscow grew from just a small city state to controlling this whole big chunk of northern Europe, all the way from Poland up to the Arctic Ocean. How did using how did taxing people get them bigger? Well, money is power. So they have the right to tax all of the peasants around their city. They tax the peasants, they give most of it to the Mongols, but they keep some of it for themselves. Oh. And then they use that money to update their army, expand their roads, which then allows them to tax people even more effectively. People are much more likely to pay you tax revenue if you have a bunch of guys with guns. <laughs> Because tax collectors offer people basically the same deal that Mongols offer cities. Hello, it's time to pay your taxes. You don't have to pay your taxes, but if you don't, you have to talk to my friend over here with the musket. Okay, so um, that's basically where Moscow comes from. So they work with the Mongols until they are big enough and strong enough that they can eventually rebel against the Mongols and overthrow them, which they do around 1480. So for about 240 years, Russia is under the Mongols. And in 1480, Moscow kicks the, Russia, or kicks the Mongols out and then unifies all of Russia under their control. Let's pause for a second. How's the note taking going today, guys? Good. Is it going OK? Does it help that I've eliminated a lot of words off of the slides? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, cool. So ideally, what you guys should be able to do is you should be able to process what's on the board, but also follow most of what I'm saying, and then just jot down some ideas as we go. Is that working for y'all? I just noticed that. 1480. Yeah, so from 1240 to 1480, they are under the control of the Mongols. Yes, Cora. And they were unified under who after that? Or under that? Moscow. Okay. Wait, 1240 to what? 1240 to 1480, okay. they are under the control of the Mongols. Okay, thank you. Could you go to the next slide for me? 
The time that they are under the control of the Mongols is known as the Mongol yoke. Not like egg yolk. What does yolk, Y-O-K-E, mean? What does it mean to get yoked? Strong. <laughs> yeah, but that's actually a very weird use of the term. A yoke is something that you put on horses or oxen when you're plowing a field. Like, like that piece of wood that you put on the back of the horse that the horse then pulls. So the Mongol yoke is like imagining Russia as the cow or the horse. And then the Mongols are yoking Russia to their plow. So they're using Russia to do their work for them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I can draw you a picture. You want me to draw you a picture? Mm -hmm. Okay. I so. This is Russia. And this is the Mongols. Thanks. So, Russia's doing all the work, and the Mongols are using Russia to do their work for them, to plow the field and to make them money. So Russia is doing all the farming, and Russia's eating all the food. All right, so anyway, it's called the Mongol yoke. During the time of the Mongol yoke, <laughs> Russia is cut off from the rest of Europe. So whereas the rest of Europe during this time period is going to go through the Renaissance, and, um, or at least start going through the Renaissance and stuff like that, and later go on through the Reformation and invent the printing press and discover the Americas, quote unquote, um, Russia is going to be stuck paying taxes to the Mongols. And they're mostly going to be looking east towards the Mongols rather than west towards Western Europe. So Russia is going to be kind of cut off from the rest of Europe and be very culturally different because of this experience. Um, another thing that's happening is because they're paying super heavy taxes, this is going to highly limit the economic development of Russia. Instead of their population increasing and their cities growing in scale, most of the wealth is going to be going off to Mongolia instead. Also, they copy the absolutist model of Mongol rule, which means that individuals under the king do not have any legal rights. If the king decides that you need to die, that is the king's judgment, and you are not in any position to question that. Um, so this leads to a model of authoritarian government that persists throughout the rest of Russian history. Russia has never been a democracy and does not look like it's going to be a democracy anytime soon. Also, Russians adopt brutal methods of warfare that are more or less normal for the Mongols and are used by the Russians against the Mongols. So the war between the Mongols and the Russians for control of Eastern Europe and Northern Asia is brutal. Now, some historians argue that the Mongol yoke was not a huge deal and that Russia would have been really different and isolated anyway. I am not well versed enough on the controversy to be able to judge. But most historians argue that at least the Mongol yoke isolated Russia to at least some extent and made Russia just a little bit different from the rest of Europe. So whereas the rest of Europe is facing the Atlantic and is expanding using ships into the rest of the world, Russia is just expanding further and further east and it's kind of doing its own thing, which is why Russia is going to be kind of European but kind of Asian. Later on in Russian history, they're going to have an existential crisis. They're going to be like, wait a second. 
are we Asians? Or are we white people? Are we white Asians? What does that even mean? <laughs> so, um, and of course, I don't know the answer to that question. But um, that's all important to keep in mind. And we'll be revisiting Russia more and more as we move forward in world history because they're going to emerge more and more as major world powers. Um, next slide, please. Sure. Now, one last thing. Western Europe gets maybe the best possible deal out of anybody from the Mongol conquests. They get lucky. Western Europe gets lucky. And the reason is, is that they get all the benefits of Mongol rule without any of the costs, except the Black Death. But everybody gets the Black Death, except the Americas and Sub-Saharan Africa. All right, but so, why did the Mongols never conquer Western Europe? Well, from the Pope's perspective, it is obviously God's divine will that led to the death of Guyab Khan and the withdrawal of the Mongols back to Mongolia. But the real reason in my opinion, is that Europe is wet, hilly, poor, and obsessed with building castles. So it's going to be pretty hard to invade, and it's not really going to pay off. So the Mongols never, just never really prioritize it. There's better places to conquer. Western Europe gets huge benefits, though. First of all, they get access to the entire Mongol family corporation, and they're allowed to trade with everybody. They also get all of the amazing Chinese and Islamic technology that was developed by the Mongols and the predecessors of the Mongols uh, for free, basically. They get gunpowder, they get printing, they get everything. Marco Polo is important because he symbolizes this. Marco Polo is a Venetian trader who is able to safely travel from Venice to the easternmost edge of China, and then back. He makes it back, soon, uh, and he is still young enough and healthy enough to write down a book describing all of the marvels that he saw. Chinese cities that dwarf any city in Europe with hundreds of markets. Weird black rocks that you can burn as if they were made of wood. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Ben. Yeah. And ice cream. Ice cream? Yeah. China had like the first kind of ice cream, and then he brought it back to Italy, and then oh. they made the gelato. You know, I've actually looked into the history of ice cream multiple times, partially for weird history. Um, and the very first example of ice cream I can find was actually created for the Emperor Nero, where he required people to basically run up to the tops of mountains in wintertime and scoop up snow, and then run back and mix it with honey and fruit. But maybe that's more of a snow cone. Yeah, that, that's just nearer being crazy. <laughs> yeah, but so one other thing is Marco Polo did come back and describe pasta to the Italians, which we should be eternally grateful to him for. Noodles. Yeah, but so now, anyway, guys, that's all I have for you today. Unfortunately, we're not going to get to talk about China. I hope you have an amazing long weekend. And I hope you're looking forward to doing the DBQ next week. Yay! Okay, bye.